that's the real way to check. Uh, let's see. Oh, so, okay. So first and foremost, uh, even though it's the last bullet here, syllabus has been updated. I rearranged a few things. Uh, take a look because some of the reading timing has changed a bit. So, uh, you know, so you don't get caught off guard, uh, do take a look. It is updated in Piazza. Um, so, you know, let me know if you have any questions, if I did anything stupid like typos. Uh, but yeah, there's that. The ethics assessment. So this is your, so as you remember, you did the ethics assessment for the, like the case study and you did one on kind of your own, you know, thing you sourced. Now you're to do one on your actual project, okay? However, it is a group assignment. So only submit one as a group, okay? Um, and if you have any trouble with that, let me know or whatever. I, I've seen a number of people have never used the group on Gradescope, um, which is totally fine. And then uh, assignment two has been released, which is, oh, the backlog and um, problem statement. Um, it is a little dependent on your meeting with the client. So if you're unable to schedule the meeting with the client or without enough time, please let me know, uh, CC your PM or like CC your whole team, send me an email and say, first we can get, you know, a meeting with our clients and talk to them about this stuff, uh, you know, is five minutes before it's due. I'm going to give you an extension. Okay. So just let me know. Hopefully we'll get it done soon because the sooner you get through that activity with the client and write the, the content for it, the faster you can start on the project. Okay. So, and I want to have, I want you to have as much time as possible for the project itself. Um, one team member uh, kind of came up to me about one of the projects. Um, these projects are meant to be a little bit what you make them. So obviously we can't predict in advance who comes into the class with what background entirely. So, you know, you may have been assigned to a team where, and you look at the project and you're like, I don't know what I can contribute here. If you feel like that's the case, like let your PM know uh, that you want to have a conversation with me um, or, you know, you can have a conversation with me or your team can have a conversation with me because all of these projects I know well enough that I can say, you know, hey, instead of focusing on this thing that is described very detailed in the product description, let's do a slight variant on that that's more aligned with your skill set. Does that make sense? Okay. Anybody? Uh, uh, yeah, so like follow up with me afterwards. Um, last thing, we uh, make sure if you uh, did not pass the assessment that you meet with me after class today. Um, that seemed like when everybody uh, seemed like they had a chance. Um, you know, if it doesn't work, tell me that on your way out, and then and we'll schedule something else. But I, I do need to talk to anybody who didn't pass the assessment, even if you made it work since then. Okay. Any questions? All right. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, should our PM have reached out to us from now? Probably. Um, have they not? No. Okay. Uh, what team are you? Okay. Um, yeah, I'll have to follow up. I'm not, who is your PM? Um, a four? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I'll check in with them. Um, you okay. should hear from them by the end of the week. Same thing for our group. Okay. Same PM? Yeah, same. Okay. So clearly he hasn't written his emails yet. So I will uh, I will message him and find out why not. So, um, but yeah, I would I would really like them to be contacting you already. Um, the, the other PM has done this several times now. So she's very on top of it. Uh, so a port just may need a, may need the, uh, you know, the kick to say, we gotta move, we don't have much time. Um, so like I said, I will follow up with them. Uh, any other questions? Okay, uh, let's see. I feel like I'm forgetting something. Um, all right, first and foremost, um, if you don't know this already, I'm telling you this now. Screenshots of bug reports are one of my biggest pet peeves, okay? If you do this, I will be very unhappy with you. I will probably make fun of you, okay? Don't do it, okay? As my brother, uh, who works in tech as well, literally said to me today when I was joking around about how to give this talk or whatever, that um, a lot of his, uh, so he kind of works in more of a support function. And so a lot of people who are reporting problems to him 
send him screenshots. And he's like, yeah, so right before I go try to figure out what your problem is that you're having, I get to transcribe the text from the image that you sent me. Because that's how I'm going to get it into Google to try to figure out what the problem is, right? So if you send me a picture of something that was text, that's going to make me unhappy. Do you see why that might make me unhappy? Everybody agree with me? So if you can give me a good argument for why a screenshot makes more sense, uh, I will still not believe you. And then you can do that too. Apparently, Professor Miller over there disagrees. Oh, I'm just curious. Uh, what are your thoughts on both the screenshot and the text? That sometimes can be even better. Or a screenshot to give context. Um, and then, you know, basically the specifics of the error. That can also be useful. Like if, what, if the problem, for example, is with the UI issue, uh, a screenshot usually helps. Um, but if you're if you're screenshotting something that's text, usually it's not a good idea. So um, this is basically tips on bug reporting. Primarily, especially if you get involved in open source, this is a good way to make friends in open source. Okay, do bug reports on things that you uh, think are important, you know, or you have a problem with, whatever. Like the developers really appreciate hearing about problems that you're having with their thing, whatever it is. Um, however. They get a lot of them. So if you can follow certain rules, it makes it much nicer. This, this section I sometimes also include is like etiquette, right? Um, but so when you're doing a bug report, uh, it's usually a bad idea to include a ton of logs in the report. Try to scope it to the part that's relevant. Sometimes, however, you do need to include the whole thing because you don't know what's relevant, which is perfectly possible when you're working with somebody else's software, right? So what you do for that is actually attach it somehow differently, right? So attach it as a text file, or there's this cool website that's you know open source and free called Pastebin um, that you can paste a bunch of content there, and it'll give you a link back, and you can put the link in the bug report. Um, another common problem, especially when you do screenshot bug reports, is doing what's called leaking information, okay? From leaking information security or whatever. When you're doing your bug report mask the name of your machine, your IP address, your username, okay? All those things don't belong on the public internet, okay? Because every bit of information that somebody can get about your network or how your computer is set up is something else like to go into the bucket of how to exploit your, your environment, okay? So be really careful with that. And like I said, it tends to happen more often with screenshots just because you, you have less control in the sense of what is being shot, you know? Um, but it happens both ways. So just be careful. And then be sure it hasn't already been reported. Okay, this is another one where it's a, a good way to make enemies as developers is, um, and I was going to show you right now, actually. If I can find my mouse, I really have no idea where it is. There it is. These links aren't going to work, are they? Just to make my life easier. Come on, seriously? This whole uh, top hat thing, man. I'm not sure how I feel about it. All right, let me just go. If I spelled GitHub correctly, that would also help. All right, so this is a popular containerization project um, with which I am very familiar. Um, so this is GitHub issue reporting. Uh, hopefully you may have seen it before. Um, but if you notice, uh, I don't know, oh, I think, I'm not sure I had a great example of this, but let's say, uh, we can actually do this. Um, so I've definitely reported bugs here. Uh, did I spell my name correctly? Yeah. Um, so I get no results, right? That's not good enough searching. Better searching 
is you want to remove the is open. Okay. Oh, I got to remove the is PR too. Oh my goodness, I cannot type today. All right, I know I have my, oh, I'm not on issues. That's why. My bad. I wondered why PR was there. Okay, so. See, so I have two rogue reports that have been fixed. Okay. Or declared not a bug, and that's the which one. Um, yeah, so this one actually scaled out. So this was actually not fixed. It was declared a feature request. Okay. And then it got stale issue, which basically means that it died on the bind because nobody picked it up. Okay. However, that doesn't mean that's not good information for you if you run into something that is, you know, similar, right? Um, so you want to always make sure you do a search with both the open and the closed. Um, and then what else? Uh, and then, you know, this happens to be a really well managed project. You will often not see nice decorators like this on there, but this one happens to do them. So, but this is kind of like how you do a, a bug report. And then I was going to show, so it's a little bit. So as you can see, right, I mean, I try, so first of all, they have a template for their bug reports. So a bunch of these fields they ask for. And so I fill them all in very carefully. And then I, you know, kind of like ask my actual question. And then I kind of, you know, keep going back and forth. One of the other things that's super annoying is if they ask you something back, answer okay hopefully faster than i probably did i tend to be a little laggy on this sort of thing okay so that's just bug reporting um and then if i can get my oh my goodness so one three one eight five did i get rid of all the numbers So this one's a little bit anomalous, um, but I wanted to show you like, that is a lot of information to put in a bug report, okay? Like this big, huge, I think YAML file maybe, um, like maybe that should be in a test rather than a file directly in there. It could be a little weird. Podman tends to like long bug reports, but it, this is where, this is the kind of thing where I'm gonna think about whether or not I should really include it directly. Um, the other kind of thing, if you look at this too, this is also the kind of thing that leaks like crazy, okay? Because nine times out of ten, you'll have your host name in here, or you'll have, you know, uh, you know, your username or whatever. So that's the kind of thing you want to strip out. And I, I leave it there, but I just replace it with server name, right? Or I replace it with username or something like that, like something generic, uh, so that it doesn't lead back to me. Does that make sense? So, next thing I want to talk about was um, this is a little bit more like this. A lot of this is kind of etiquette and communication and that kind of stuff. But so we talk about bug reporting and how to do it to make friends rather than make enemies. Um, this is kind of an overview of like when you're walking into an organization, the kinds of things that you should start to notice. Okay. And this is a little bit of an agenda slide. So I'm going to try not to talk to the agenda slide. Um, this is very dangerous. I was actually joking around about this with Professor Miller. Um, I have a friend who, uh, whenever she starts a new job, uh, for the first month, she basically is there like, you know, seven to nine, every like seven a.m. to nine p.m. every day. Um, and she also schedules emails such that they go out even later or go out even earlier, uh, so that she gives the strong impression for about the first month that she works all the time. Um, while wildly disingenuous, it has consistently caused everywhere that she's ever worked, everyone to think of her as an incredibly hard worker. Um, now, the trade off to that is she actually is an incredibly hard worker. But the idea is that that first month that you're with an organization, it will stick. So be very conscious of what you're doing that first month. You know, if you have an organization where that, um, you know, 
uh, does a lot of working from home. That's what that acronym is. The WFM is work from home, WFH, sorry. Um, and core hours, um, like need exceed, right? Over basically, you know, over or under promise, over deliver, right? So if you have core hours, does anybody here know what core hours are? Sorry. Uh, so a lot of organizations um, have what they call core hours, where everyone should be available from, say, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. But then you can be a 6 a.m. arrival worker and leave at 2, or you could be somebody who gets in at 10 and leaves at 8, right? And I'm just making up the bounds. But, uh, so, but they have a core so that everyone can be aware of when they can reach anyone. This is getting increasingly difficult when you talk about multiple time zones, um, but it's the idea. Uh, working from home, a lot of organizations now, actually right now, a lot of organizations are complete work from home, but even when they're not, they might have some rules around working from home. Now, those are difficult because they can both be written rules and implicit rules. So like ones that just everybody knows. So these are the things to watch for, okay? Especially the implicit rules and making sure, like I said, under promise over deliver, making sure you're meeting or doing better than what they're expecting. So if everyone is out every Friday, for the first few Fridays, I would recommend coming to the office, okay? Then start to fall into the pattern of other people. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, you, you also have to judge bosses a little bit too, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, some, some get really anxious about it. Like you can tell there's a lot of companies now currently struggling with work from home because the senior leadership believes no one does any work if they work from home. Uh, so they have a, they're struggling with this a lot because they just have this mistaken notion that it's a terrible idea. All right, questions? Okay. Communication, we talked about this a bit already uh, when I made these slides. We hadn't really talked about it, uh, so but I'll just kind of mention them quickly. This is the messaging versus email, async versus sync. Um, this is a couple of things that are interesting. Uh, yeah, I only have slides on one of them. Um, one word replies. So uh, particularly old school uh, tech people um, don't believe in kind of saying thanks over text messaging or email because it's kind of like, why are you wasting the ether, right? Why are you wasting the bandwidth just to say something that's implied, right? So. Be aware of that, okay? So don't take offense if somebody doesn't say thanks. Um, I actually have a colleague here who, even though I pretty regularly say thanks anyway, they often say, you're welcome. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, I, I don't need that much, you know, internet bandwidth, right? Like, um, so that kind of thing. So just kind of keep in mind that particularly one word replies are commonly not used, okay? Of any kind, okay? So, um, and in this sense, if you think about like how people use Slack a lot, emojis have actually taken the place of those a lot, where you emoji the, the message to indicate that you understood it, okay? And then increasingly the emojis are changing meaning, and so that gets harder and stuff, but that's a different, that's for a different day. Um, and, and, and sorry, this is actually the same as that, uh, you know, acknowledgement, you need to be careful about what, like, how do you acknowledge somebody? Um, and the way I learn this in any, because every organization tends to be different, watch what everybody else does and try to mimic it. You usually have a grace period, right? So you can figure it out. Uh, the last one is called the naked ping. This is also one of my pet peeves. Um, <clears throat> so this is when you send a message that says, hey, are you there? Especially over some sort of like instant messenger. Okay because my time is clearly less valuable than yours, right? So you're, it doesn't matter what I might be doing. You just reach out and say, hey, you there? Because clearly whatever you want is more important than what I might be doing, okay? This is a naked thing. So they're really bad, right? Because they basically they are putting the onus on the, on the person you're asking a favor from. You're saying my time is more important than yours because you're saying interrupt whatever you're doing and answer me. So instead, what you should do is include whatever it is. You can stay, still say, hey, you there? I'm having this problem with this piece of code.
but you put it all in the same message so it all goes across at once because the communication is asynchronous, right? And so what it is, is like you send your message, right? And eventually I'll reply. If I'm busy, I'll reply later, like giving a lecture, for example. But if I'm not busy and I'm staring at the screen, I might answer you immediately. But either way, then it's on me, it's on my time. You're respecting my time for when I should respond. Right? Sometimes different with friends. Many of my friends, it still annoys me. Um, so take it or leave it. But uh, so this guy is uh, very well known in the open source world, also at Red Hat, um, and wrote this, I thought, very funny uh, bit about the naked thing. Yes. Out of curiosity, so what if you have a question to your colleagues that if they're available, might be helpful? If they're not available, then I would put that in the message. So in other words, I would still include whatever the question is um, and say, you know, hey, if you get to this, it'd be great. If you don't, whatever. Um, so I'd be explicit in that communication. Uh, you know, and, and if you don't think you need someone's help, you know, there's actually, this kind of goes back to another thing. Um, Microsoft, many years ago, uh, did actually a study of their workers, uh, like tech workers, and discovered that, um, let's say, you know, the two of us are working on something together, and I'm the more senior developer. And so I'm working away on my thing. You run into a problem. So what you do is you call over to my cubicle and say, hey, Langdon, I need help with blah, blah, blah. And so I interrupt and I go and help fix whatever it is. The problem with that is not so much the you know, it's, it's really good, right, that I'm helpful or whatever. But for me to get back to where I was is what the study found was 15 minutes it takes me to get back to where I was. So if you have a two second question, that's a lot of expenditure for 15 minutes, right? So that was at the time, uh, Microsoft, that's what they did to justify why every developer got an office okay, with a door. Because if it's a little bit harder to get to me, then you won't ask me a two second question. You'll ask me a 20 minute question, which then the 15 minutes is fine, right? So that's kind of the idea. So when you're doing these kinds of things, when you're doing it like over instant messaging or whatever, um, I can put my headphones on, turn off notifications, right? Decide when I'm going to stay completely focused and when I'm going to elect to answer questions, whatever. And the more senior I am, the less I better be focused straight on the thing, I better have a lot more opportunities where I'm going to check messages and helping other people out. Does that make sense? So obviously it's a little bit anecdotal, but I found it to be generally true. Uh, I think most people agree with me. Um, although the term naked ping is a very uh, kind of open source, hardcore coder kind of term that you don't see a lot, but I think it's funny. So, and I think it's very accurate. Um, do you all know what a ping is? Okay, all right. Because if you don't know what that is, it's not going to mean it. <laughs> all right. Uh, so meetings. Okay, another thing to notice about an organization: how are meetings run, um, and what preparation is expected. Uh, I don't think I talked about this in here, right? Did I? No. Okay. So, is there an agenda? So these are things that are different by different organizations. I, I have no opinion on whether they're better or worse. I'm not a product manager. I'm not, you know, that's not what I do. However, you need to know what they are at a given organization because if everybody else walks into the meeting having read the 20 page book or the, you know, the 20 page document beforehand and you haven't, you're going to look bad, right? So find out what the answer is. In fact, um, yeah, so. Uh, it, uh, and I think it's actually Amazon in general, but AWS at least um, has, uh, they actually refer to it as paper meetings. And one of the problems that you have with meetings is that uh, people don't have the time outside of the meeting to prepare for the meeting, right? So what I actually do to solve this problem is I'll actually put another meeting on my calendar right before the meeting so that I can prepare for it, okay? But what Amazon does is they actually schedule their hour meeting to be an hour and a half. And the first half hour is actually spent preparing for the meeting. Um, and 
that what the nice thing about that is that um, not only is everybody compared then, but also it gives the person who's offering whatever it is that you need to discuss a set time when it's due that's as close to the meeting as possible, right? So you don't have to, because my calendar, I may not have put that half hour I have to prepare for the meeting right before it. I might've put it the night before, right? So that means I need to have the document the night before. So what this does is they, you know, kind of build it right into the meeting. And the term that they have is they call them paper meetings. And uh, at least until pandemic times, uh, they were literally on paper. So like you would actually, the person or whatever would bring, you know, X copies of the 20 page document for everyone to read. I do not condone, but as far as uh, that's, that's where the term comes from. Make sense? Questions? Thoughts? More paper meetings? I can print all the slides before every class. I, I also won't do that. All right, another thing, dress code. How do you know what to wear? Okay, um, I struggled with this when I joined BU, for example, because I am wicked dressed up, okay, for me, for working in development, right? Uh, but what's funny is that uh, before I joined Red Hat, so when I joined Red Hat, I joined as a developer advocate, okay? So somebody who goes and talks to developers about the products that we build, what they, the good things they find about them, the bad things they find about them, et cetera, what they might not know about that might help them, that kind of stuff. So I had to look the part of a developer, right? So uh, when I joined Red Hat was the first time I started, I wore jeans regularly where I've got my first hoodie, okay? Because it just wasn't like really my style. I pretty much actually dressed in like dress shirts and, and khakis or shorts. Um, and, but to, to look like a developer, I gotta have to lose the dress shirts, right? Wear t-shirts all the time with a hoodie. And it's, so I adapted my, what I looked like to make sure I fit the part, right? And then when I joined BU, I kind of went a little bit the other direction. I couldn't go quite as far as a lot of people I see running around who are professors who are wearing like jackets, right? And I'm like, that's a lot. Um, so, oh, hey, look, I even quoted myself. Um, so these are things to be aware of, right? Uh, and you basically just look around. It's usually because obviously your first day is a little late to learn what the dress code is. So one of the tricks that I use is during the interview process, make sure you look around, even ask for a tour to make sure you can kind of see what other people are wearing. And keep in the back of your mind that if you're there on a Friday, it is likely the dress code is different than it is every other day, okay? Or, you know, other, there was for a while a rash of dress down Wednesdays. I was like, are you lost? Like, it doesn't, it doesn't flow. Like, I don't know. So just keep it in mind. Um, one of the organizations I worked with, I think as a consultant, actually had dress up Friday. So it was t-shirts and jeans most of the time and suits on Fridays. Uh, just kind of for the change of pace, which I kind of liked. I thought it was cool. All right. Let's see, how are we doing on time? Not too bad. I told you there's a lot of slides. All right, table matters. They matter, they make a difference, okay? Uh, does anybody know who Warren Buffett is? All right, so, oh, wait. Yeah, so it was either Warren Buffett or the super famous CEO of GE, what's his name? Jack, Jack Welch, um, who said this. Um, and basically, if they don't have good table manners, I won't hire them. Uh, in fact, MIT used to, I don't know if they still do, uh, have a course that was required for graduation for CS majors about table manners. So they do make a difference. So if you don't know what they are, or at least can pass, right? Like most of the time, um, go find out. It's not that hard to learn. So yeah, uh, and you will almost always, if it's a, if it's a like professional organization, uh, you know, like established organization, that's a better word, but versus like a startup or whatever, you will almost always have a day long interview at some point. During that day long interview, there will be a, a meal. Um, so it will happen. All right. Everybody good on etiquette? Are you all going to be perfect now? Cool. Like I said, the biggest thing is uh, it's kind of like what I'm trying to point out is like 
things to notice while you're kind of looking around so that you can replicate them. I don't really have strong opinions too often on whether they're right or wrong or indifferent, just that you want to fit the part. Yeah. Okay, so history of software, um, particularly when we talk about sharing. Um, so as you may or may not know, um, in the old days of software, so like 70s, um, 80s, somewhat, mostly like 60s and 70s, um, it was very, very common, if not almost required, for developers to share code with each other. Okay, all the time, any any kind of software, whatever. Um, much like people share recipes, like you know, just it would just you showed you shared stuff all the time. It was obviously harder than without the internet and things like that, but it was very very common. Um, and there was a term that was developed for people who were particularly good at like figuring something out and then um, you know and kind of sharing that knowledge with the community, and they were called hackers. Um, and then, and the big thing about hackers was not only were they good at figuring things out, but they were also good at sharing it. Um, and then a few years later, uh, there started to be hackers who were performing bad acts, right? And so the industry came up with the term of cracker for a person who did that. The media, however, liked hacker better. So that's why hacker is a negative term today. So, which I think is very, very sad. Um, but if you are in certain communities, you will still regularly see hacker as a positive, like, you know, uh, like, yeah, a very positive term, um, particularly like you see it in um, like 3D printing worlds, like maker uh, stuff, uh, you'll see hack the hacker term much more commonly used positively. Okay, so, but kind of keep in mind, back in the day, everybody shared software. Then, people started to realize that you could sell, you can make money off of it. So they stopped sharing. And the first big thing that stopped being shared was compilers. And it started to be ridiculously expensive to buy a compiler. And as a result, that shut out huge amount of developers and that kind of stuff, right? Because they couldn't afford the compiler. And don't forget, this is in the days before things like Python, which, I mean, it does need a compiler, but not as sophisticated a compiler. So, um, then we kind of move somewhat orthogonally to open source, okay? So open source, the idea is the free sharing and distribution of ideas and implementation. Free to use, free to modify with no discrimination, okay? So it is not open source if you indicate that some other, some particular type of group, another country um, has commonly come up, okay? For example, that is not open source. Okay, so just kind of keep that in mind. Um, it should just be available. So the history of open source, which was kind of sparked by those really, really expensive compilers, was this guy, Richard Solman. Anyone ever heard of him? Which is funny because he works across the river at MIT. Um, and uh, maybe a year or two ago, was finally kicked out of his own project for uh, how badly he treated women. Um, but he did start free software. So for that, he has to get a little bit of credit, even if he's had some very questionable uh, other kinds of activity. So uh, free software versus open source software. Uh, does anybody know what the difference is? All right. So free software is software you can use for free which may be open source, but may not, okay? You don't see it too much. Well, I guess you do. Um, so most of the apps you have on your phone, those are free software, right? You don't have access to the source code, but you're not paying any cash dollars for it, okay? You're probably paying for it in all your personal, uh, personal information. That's a different story. Okay, um, so very different philosophy. So it's not open source just because it's free. It's only open source if you can actually access the source code. Um, and it's focused on user freedoms and the, and development methods, so like open development methods. Um, and in the, the internet is used primarily to share information. So that has actually spawned all these other open things, okay? Some that have really skyrocketed, 
open data, open research are really going up. Um, let's see, the other one, open hardware is also huge. So basically the idea is people are putting it front, open in front of whatever it is they do, right? To say that they're following the same belief system, but on whatever thing they do. So, um, oops, there was something else I was going to mention about this. But, um, so, the advantages to open source are here, right? One of the biggest ones is actually no vendor lock in. Okay. So, in other words, if you don't like paying Red Hat for your Linux server, you can stop and you just keep it because it's open source. So, you own it. It doesn't make any difference if you stop paying Red Hat. You can also turn around and go to SUSE, which is a competitor Red Hat, and pay them instead. Okay? They might have certain rules about how exactly, um, because Red Hat doesn't really trust SUSE and vice versa. So they might say, you have to make these modifications in order to, be, to get our support, which I think is perfectly legitimate. But uh, beyond that, it's com you're completely open to do so. And because it's open source, you can't have special features that aren't available to everyone, right? So, for example, uh, have you ever heard of Embrace and Extend? This was a, uh, a negative slogan applied to Microsoft back in the day. Uh, particularly, it started with HTML um, and things like, does anybody ever use the Blink tag? So the Blink tag was actually inserted in the HTML, to the best of my knowledge, by Microsoft. Um, as a way to capture people on the Internet Explorer. Okay, so certain HTML tags would only render in the Internet Explorer back in the day. And this was Microsoft's method of, well, there's this open thing, so let's embrace it, but then we'll extend it with proprietary extensions so that we can lock you in. Microsoft's a much better company now. If you haven't read, uh, uh, what's his name? The CEO of Microsoft now, I'm blanking on his name. Um, if you, uh, his uh, autobiography is really good. Um, and I don't even like autobiography. So cost, quality, security, those are usually obvious. All right, but there's disadvantages too. So feature creep. So in other words, like if you have a piece of software that does one thing well, it, if it's open source, a lot of times it will start to gain features, which you may not need. And you know, every, the bigger the software, the more bugs it has, the more problems it has, the more security flaws, it's just by definition, right? So it can be a problem. Um, testing, unless you're buying it from a vendor like Red Hat, the set, testing of that software is not guaranteed, right? So if you go and use generic Linux from somewhere, like you don't know how it's been tested because there's no company that's certifying that they tested it. Okay, so you gotta be careful of that. So this is what, companies like Red Hat make their money on is that they're certifying to you that all the software is legal and that it has all been tested. Um, review process could be slow. That seems obvious, right? If you have a bunch of volunteers working on software and you have a new piece of code come in, getting that reviewed and actually implemented into the code can sometimes take a while. And then because a lot of the time open source software is created by a developer who is what's usually referred to as scratching an itch. Normally what gets you into open source is something about your computer really annoys you. And so you go and build some software to fix that. And that's how you get your open source. But if I'm the developer and I'm using it for myself, what I often don't do is write any docs, okay? You also don't get any support except for a community unless you go and pay for it. So, uh, so these, you know, these two things really are where the vendors come in and try to offset it, but they can be problematic. One of the other huge things that I should probably have on this slide is that just because the source is open does not mean that you will figure out the source anytime soon, okay? Because it, like Linux, for example, right? it's millions of lines of code. So yeah, it's open. You can go and take a look at it anytime you want. Come back and tell me when you can fix something in there, right? So that's a whole nother level of understanding. So that, that's often glossed over, I think. All right. So, so.
sadly, you will probably find some of these surprises. Um, but, you know, I mentioned Linux a lot. There's a big competitor to it called FreeBSD. Has anybody ever heard of FreeBSD? Uh, easily two thirds of you are running right now. That's what Mac is based on. Okay, so uh, FreeBSD was kind of kind of basically a competitor to Linux um, with some, you know, like any piece of software you have, the reason you have different versions or different types of software a lot of times is because like they make different trade-offs. So FreeBSD has some different trade-offs from Linux, but at the end of the day, they accomplish the same goal. They run a computer, right? Um, Android also based on Linux, but is its own uh, free and open software. However, the Android you get on your phone, if you have an Android phone, is not because of two reasons. One, Google adds a whole bunch of proprietary software to it. And two, because the hardware manufacturers don't open source their drivers. So Android has to use those drivers, right, to actually get to the hardware. Um, but a lot of time that's proprietary. And actually, it's why it's so hard to run Linux on a laptop is because you have to be get open source drivers too. Right? All right, so programming languages, Rust, Ruby, Python, they're all open source. Um, uh, actually, most programming languages I can think of right now are open source, with the exception sort of of the Microsoft languages. Um, C Sharp is like 90% open source now, which is awesome. But most languages are open source now. And why is that super useful? Because sometimes when you really don't understand how something is working, like you know, you're getting a Python bug or you're getting a, you know, Python isn't performing well in some scenario, you can actually go look at the source for it. And it may take you a while to figure it out, but you can look at that method and be like, oh, that's why it's got a hot spot here. If I use it differently or I use a different method. Maybe I can get rid of that hot spot. Uh, any other examples? Oh, actually, sorry, I didn't mention Firefox, which is a crowning achievement open source software. Like lots and lots of people use it, fewer these days. Um, open Office is a competitor to Microsoft Office. Uh, so if you don't want to pay for Microsoft Office, it's pretty comparable. Um, so let me ask you a question. What about Chrome? Is Chrome open source? Let me know. How many use Chrome? How many use Firefox? How about, uh, I bet nobody uses Safari, at least by choice. Uh, <laughs> let's see, we, we can go through the whole list, but of an Opera or Blaze or, um, all right, so is Chrome open source? Let me know. I think Chromium, the more that's going on is open source, but not so much. Correct. So the vast majority of Chrome is open source, um, like 90-ish percent. Uh, in a project called Chrome. It's funny, I have the option on Linux, right, to install one or the other, um, which is, you know, interesting. Um, okay, anybody else examples of open source software that are not like programming languages? Yeah. Eagle? Eagle is a language that's very cool. Oh, maybe. I don't know that one. And redraw is that what it's called? E draw. E like e e oh, 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 yeah. So it's probably so a lot of open source software uh, ends up with a G in the front of it because the original project was called the GNU project. Um, and uh, so and then we heard of a, a what's it called? Uh, not cyclical, but like a cyclical acronym, but that's not the right word. Recursive acronym. So GNU is a recursive acronym, GNU is not Unix is what it stands for. So the thing is in the name is the expansion of the thing. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of them. Uh, like uh, Pine, old email client, uh, which was a competitor, like replaced a competitor called Elm. Uh, and so Pine, Pine is not Elm. Um, so those are my favorite kind of acts. All right. So uh, a lot of them end up with G in the front because of that, uh, because of GNU. Anybody else? Ideas? Right, so so a lot of programming stuff is these days. Um, but I was kind of looking for like general purpose software. Um, yeah. JavaScript. 
No, so ECMAScript is actually the open standard. Uh, JavaScript is the problem with JavaScript. So Firefox's JavaScript is open source. The problem is everybody has their own engine. Um, and so the most commonly used engine is probably what's called, it's called V8 or version eight, which is actually authored primarily by Google and is shipped primarily by Chrome, uh, which is why uh, there was a huge developer adoption of Chrome for a while because the JavaScript engine was a lot faster than anywhere else. Uh, but now V8 is pretty common all over the place, but V8 is also open source. So, but Safari's JavaScript could very well be proprietary. I don't know. Does that make sense? So there is, uh, you often are not, like, you're not all using the same JavaScript a lot of the time. Although V8 is so popular now that you probably are. Okay. Uh, I know far too much about software. All right, moving on to licenses. Okay, so I talked about open source and what it was and that stuff. This is what makes it open source, okay? And Stallman's original thing was creating the GNU general public license, okay? Usually just referred to it as the GPL or you know general public license. Uh, we are actually up to V3 at the moment. Um, however, uh, Linus Torvalds, you all know who he is? You know who Linus Torvalds is? Horrifying. All right, he's the guy who created Linux and Git. So uh, big open source problem, put it mildly. Um, he actually sticks with V2. He doesn't like V3 for some of the some of the rules there. So the GPL is strongly protects user liberty. So basically, you know, it's like everything has trade-offs, right? And so this one pushes hard on the user liberty uh, side of open source. And the way it does that is through what's usually nicknamed copy left, okay? And this left is left as in leftist, but it's a play on words with copyright, okay? So all changes have to be disclosed. So if you do work on a piece of software that is licensed under the GPL, you must open source your software, okay? So that's a pretty hard requirement somehow. Um, and then you currently, part of the reason for the push for V3 is has anybody ever heard of um, like Amazon? Actually, 80% of Amazon's AWS infrastructure, right? All the, the tools they offer you, almost all of those are open source underneath. Okay. But they don't have to release their changes because they're in the cloud. And the GPL v2 and before basically overscoped and said on this computer. Does that make sense? So, like, because they're offering it as a service. They don't have to disclose their changes. At least that's what their art that their lawyers are. That makes sense. So the V3 is trying to fix that. And there's a lot of argument about whether it actually does that. All right. So BSD licenses, on the other hand, um, and this is the same BSD. This is uh Berkeley software development, something. I can't remember. I know the B is Berkeley, but I can't remember what they have to do with Um but kind of favor the other direction. So way less on user liberty. So weak copy left is usually what's referred to as. It's very permissive in the sense that you don't have to disclose changes, okay? So uh, most programming languages, for example, will be licensed this way so that you can write code that isn't open source, right? Or like on top of a framework or something like that. Um, and then there's a bunch more too, um, but MIT, Apache, and the BSD licenses are all permissive like that. GPL is by far the strongest one. Um, it's the best for the world and the worst for adoption, basically, right? So that's the GPL, MIT. Like I said, but your general choices are usually GPL, MIT, and Apache. One of the things I really like about GitHub is that it prompts you to put in a license. Um, has anybody ever heard of the Creative Commons? Yeah, what is it? Do you know? I just, I don't know. You just know the name? Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? All right. I probably mentioned this in class, but um, so I do this on all of my slides and most of the stuff I release. And this is a Creative Commons license, which is what the CC means. So the difference between Creative Commons licenses and the other ones I discussed is this is usually used on anything that's like written or like a video, stuff like that. 
not things that are like software. Okay, because software and other things are kind of weird, like the legally, like they're kind of different. So I use this on a lot of my content, like for all these classes actually, is everything is Creative Commons and then it's by NC 4.0. And these uh, acronyms, all of it expands on the Creative Commons website and will show you what this license is. It'll show you like kind of a short version of it. And then it actually has the legal document behind it. Um, but they all have like acronyms to make it easier to follow them. So by means uh, you should attribute me if you reuse my stuff. And NC means you can't use it commercially. And then the 4.0 means that it's version 4.0 of the Creative Commons license. Okay, so these are super handy because what copyright would this file have if I didn't have anything like that on? So, you know, like who owns it? Can you can you borrow my slide if I didn't put that there? Any other guesses? I guess. Correct. So the opposite. Um, if there is no explicit license, the license is by default full ownership by me. So therefore it is plagiarism or stealing or whatever you want to call it that's the infringement um, if there is no license, okay? This is a common, common problem. And one of the things why I was saying, I really like how GitHub prompts you to put one in your repository because a lot of people make the mistake that if it doesn't have a license on it, it's public domain. But it is the opposite. Okay. Does so everybody know what public domain is? Okay. So public domain is the kind of license that existed before any of this stuff, which is basically after a certain amount of time, the US at least declares anything that is previously copyrighted now open to anyone, just public. Okay. It's owned by the public. So it used to be like books, it was like 70 years, give or take. Okay. It's kind of like a patent. Does anybody know how patents work? So basically, it's like the US law gives things that you create, it's meant to give you enough time to make money off of it, to kind of pay you for having developed it. But then it's supposed to go into the public domain so that it can be then used by anyone. Does that make sense? So that's the intent. That's that's the intent behind a patent last for seven years. Okay. But because lots and lots of big companies have lots of patents and lots of copyrights, they lobby on the regular to make sure that that gets longer and longer and longer through various mechanisms. So basically every time all the Disney movies are set to go to the public domain, Disney lobbies the hell out of Congress and it oddly gets extended, okay? So it's Disney movies that are the reason our copyright law has been so long. There's probably other reasons too, but they're a big part of it. Um, so yeah, the patent, is like seven years and that's like how long to get it but then there's ways to do extensions so that it goes longer um, and different things get different like patents as well as different like copyrights depending on the type of thing it is so none of this what you generally need to know but it is kind of useful to kind of tell you the origin of why we care about this stuff um All right, so that's licenses. Um, and then this is just a picture version of the same idea. And this terminology is somewhat important in that it's regularly used in organizations with the expectation that you understand it, okay? So KFC's spice blend and the recipe for Coke are what are called trade secrets. Does anybody know what a trade secret is? All right, my company will go out of business if this gets released. Okay. And that gives you, if you declare something a trade secret, this gives you a lot of power over anybody who knows it and then tries to release it. Like you can literally put, be put in jail. It's one of the few things in this kind of scenario where you go to jail. Okay. So that's why it's kind of a big deal to declare, right? You can't just say everything I produce is a trade secret, right? So it's a lot harder than that. Uh, I don't actually know what exactly it takes to make a trade secret, but it has to, it's, it's pretty high law. All right, proprietary license. That's kind of the stuff that you're, you know, if you use Mac, um, most of the Mac software is is this kind of license. Uh, they have some open source stuff too. Uh, same with Windows. 
protective cloth wiping. So that's um, like the GPL. Okay, so that's protective. Um, and then a non protective, which is more like MIT or PADP or BSP. And then public domain, which I just described a minute ago. Um, sometimes also referred to as uh, license zero, like the number zero. So if that, if you ever see that, that's what it means. All right, good. Hope there are a lot of slides. All right. Uh, so I'm not sure how much this I already covered. Um, but one of the big things is you know, open source not about giving things away for free. Um, this one is a common problem because of English primarily. So in English, the word for uh, like having liberty and uh, not costing anything are the same. They're both the word free. Okay. So in French, for example, which will often be used instead, because as you, you know, good, bad, or indifferent, whatever the two UN declared nation international languages are French and English. In French, um, libre means free as in liberty. Okay. And of course, I just blanked on the French for free as in doesn't cost anything. Uh, I know it. I just can't think of it. Uh, did I read it? My notes? Nope, not that smart. Okay, so uh, so basically, the joke about it is to say it as like in the U.S. in English, when you're talking about piece of software, is it free as in beer, or is it free as in freedom? Okay, so everybody likes free beer and freedom, so it's not that it's bad either way. It's just you need to know which one it is. Um, and our free as in speech is not a common one. Uh, cost of ownership. Um, this is one of those myths, right? So both that it appears to be free, but you have to know the ins and outs of it. So it can be quite expensive. <clears throat> this is actually why like big organizations like Facebook, for example, don't pay Red Hat to help with their Linux because it's cheaper for them to hire a bunch of gurus in Linux and support it themselves. Does that make sense? But that, that bar is quite high for something that's used for Linux. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Now, why should you care about open source? Here are some reasons. Um, so, obviously, free software for you is nice, but you being involved in open source is really what we're talking about here. It's a great way to improve programming skills in a real world sort of scenario. Um, it helps you understand the ideology and it might be something that really appeals to you. Uh, but some of the biggest things are recognition, improving software that looks good on your resume. So let's go with recognition and looking good on your resume. So because of the nature of how GitHub works, every contribution you make to an open source software, piece of software on GitHub shows up on your profile. Okay, what does that tell an employer? So two things. One, if I go look at that contribution that you can code and how well a coder you are, right? But it also tells me another really important thing, which is often more important to most employers, which is that you play well with others, right? Because you not only wrote some code, but you also convinced the owners of that project to include your code which are not the same thing, right? Just because you wrote it doesn't mean it's good enough for to be actually included, right? So that's huge when you're an employer. Okay, and then lastly, improving software. What's nice, if you use multi open source software and something really annoys you, you can theoretically go fix it or at least go uh, find the team, the project, whatever that does it, file your issue. If they don't want to fix it, then you can buy them beer, right? Maybe not legally. You can go buy them sandwiches. You can buy them coffee. You can buy them whatever. Um, but you can encourage them to work on your feature, right? This is something else that Red Hat offers, right? In the sense that being a, a customer of Red Hat means you now have access into the communities that make the software Red Hat produces. Which, you, which is hard to get, especially 
like the Linux kernel, right? Red Hat employs a whole mess of Linux kernel engineers. So if you want something new in the kernel, you can call them up and say, hey, we, your massive customer, really want this in the kernel. Can you see what you can do? Versus calling up the kernel and saying, hey, you people who I've never met and don't know and have nothing over, would you do this? That makes sense? <laughs> All right. Um, so I haven't made any of these required. But um, you will regularly, like I would be shocked, right? If you go to any organization and this, it's basically an essay, uh, doesn't come up. The cathedral in the bazaar. Um, this is much more philosophical um, and doesn't come up all that much, but kind of interesting. Very interesting. Um, and then here's a video version of something about this stuff that might be more consumable if you like watching videos versus reading text. Um, I can give you about a billion others if you're interested, um, but those are some to get started. Um, if you were going to do anything on this list uh, that I thought was most important, I would say read the cathedral in the bazaar. Uh, you could probably read it in a couple hours, uh, maybe less. I can't remember how long it is. Um, so, cool. Uh, another uh, website, too, I probably put on there, opensource.com, which is funded by Red Hat, but takes a lot of, like, is a you know, general magazine, but covers a lot of open source, both uh, kind of theoretical stuff, you know, and like, like uh, philosophical stuff, but also like software and things like that, too. Um, they did a great story about, oh, I forgot, I had the wrong laptop, but normally all of my laptops have a lot of stickers. And so they did a big story about why the developers put stickers on their laptops. That was great. And, uh, and then they started a Twitter campaign to collect pictures of laptop stickers. I think that was it. Woo, underwire. Hopefully you caught some of this. Um, so I was going to talk about deployment today too, um, but I didn't really know how far I wanted to get with it anyway. So I'm fine to kind of not talk about it. Um, and we'll talk about it when we do a little bit more. Um, just kind of for upcoming, let me just see. Uh, I know I have it somewhere here. Um, but I wanted to mention, so many windows. And between Zoom and Top Hat, my machine is like on. And our 50 page syllabus. Okay, so upcoming, I just want to mention okay, so the requirements gathering thing, which should be on Great Scope now, is coming up due soon. I uh, have it at the 15th, I think. Um, Next week, uh, part of the reason I moved the Git talk was so that a friend of mine could actually give the lecture on Tuesday. Um, and then there's a workshop associated with it um, that I'm going to ask you to do by some other date. Um, and it, it shouldn't be too big a deal. Like it should be, I, I would hope, an hour. Um, it's really it shouldn't be a lot of work. Um, but mechanics with Git makes a big difference. How many people here know Git well? Okay, my hand is also down, just to be clear. Um, so let's see. Yeah, so, so those are two big things coming up. Um, but then after that, basically beginning of March, we're gonna also do the deployment of your project. So whether you have really anything done yet or not, I want it deployed. Okay, so that there's a whole pipeline that actually deploys the thing. Um, so that as you go through the rest of the semester, every time you make changes, it's getting deployed. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and then, sorry, there was one other thing too. Oh, and then the midterm presentation. We'll talk about that in another few weeks. Um, but basically, that's the idea of it is uh, to primarily teach you how to give a good text presentation. So while it is graded, um, it's, I would say it's pretty lenient uh, because what I want is I want it, it's almost like a dry run for putting all your thoughts together, doing the presentation, all that stuff. So that at the final, the final presentation, 
is like you, you're an old hand now. You've already done it. Um, and hopefully the final presentation can be really, really good. Uh, it worked really, really well last semester. Um, and uh, so I think having a good, solid, graded practice 